Hello everyone. It is very nice to have you today. And my name is Vernon Segele. I'm one of the Herbert Humphrey Fellowship Program. Uh, I'm one of the ha Humphrey Fellows at UC Davis. I hope you know what is the Humphrey Fellowship Program. It's a US government uh, funded program and it brings about professional, we, we, they, they call us like middle career professionals, that's what they name us. So we are actually people who work for, from different countries and we work in different areas. So we come here in the United States to spend like 10 months of professional training in different areas. So I come from Tanzania and I work for the government of Tanzania and at one of the regional government administrations in, in Tanzania called Morogoro Regional Secretariat. And I normally work in the forestry or environmental conservation kind of stuff. So we are 12 people here at UC Davis. And in, uh, in the whole of the US, we are more than 150 pharaohs from different countries. And we are almost at the end of our professional career development. We are finishing and going back home uh, on the 7th of the coming month. But myself, I'll be leaving in like two days to come. So I'll be leaving the US on the 31st of uh, this, this month. And I'll be missing the country. It's so nice country. I have been enjoying living here. People are so nice. And the way when I was coming here, I normally like to say this because when I was coming here, I had a very, very negative impression with the US, you see. But then when I came here, I found totally different because people here are so loving, so supportive. They just want to see you uh, succeed in whatever you want. So that is a positive thing that I'll be taking with me back home that people in the US are good. When I was coming here, I was like, I'm going to be shot because we normally hear black people being shot. So I was like, I don't know if I'm going to come back home safe, but I'm actually about to go back home. So it's a safe country. So thank you very much, Lynn, for organizing this as well. It's a very nice opportunity for me just to say something to these people. And you don't know, you never know what might happen because we are all, uh, we are all human beings and nature is all what we want. We depend on uh, almost everything that we, we want, all our needs comes from the environment. So if we protect our environment, we will be able to keep getting all the supplies from the environment. But if we don't, we will not get all the things that we want. So that was just a brief introduction. And so I'll be going to just give you a brief overview of climate change in Tanzania. How has it been like impacting ourselves, our economy, our agricultural production, our everything so i won't cover all the details i just give you a brief overview but then you can ask i'm i'm, I'm very open i'll be able to answer all your concern so i'll start addressing talking a little bit about my country and what are the climate change drivers and then i'll talk about the the impacts and then talk about what are the challenges that we face so this is my country. This is the location of Tanzania. Tanzania is, you see, it is almost in the central part of Africa towards the southern part. So our neighbors are Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi. You have Malawi, kind of Mozambique, and the DRC Congo. So the size of my country is almost three times the size of California. So it's, it's a huge country. And it is about 2.5, so almost. <laughs> so 2.5 the size of California is very big. And the population 
is now is 60 million and we normally speak Swahili so Swahili is our our national language we don't speak English so English is just is taught as part of the subject when we do our our education and we have more than 125 different tribal languages I speak six of them so I speak Swahili and I speak five more tribal languages and we have we have been having good number of forests in terms of acreage and we have about 31 regions so regions is like I don't know how can I say this in here but it's kind of the state government the government of California so we have 31 regions in Tanzania and we have also districts you call them cities here right so we have also we have district and we have also cities so what we have we have cities we have uh, municipal and we have district councils so we have that kind of organizations so the district council is the not the lowest but kind of the middle government authority but the district council is the one that has the people you see so at the district level you have the district commissioner you have the district executive directors you have all the police department everything so these are the people the government that they have all the institution that they take care of the people so they are the immediate uh, institution that is close to the people that's the district so these are some of our national treasures i'm very proud to be a tanzanian because we have all these beautiful uh, natural environment uh, we have the highest mountain in Africa mountain Kilimanjaro is it, it is in Tanzania and also we have the Serengeti National Park I hope you might have heard about it where you have the highest concentration of large mammals in the world if you wanna go and see all these big mammals you have to go and see them uh, in the Serengeti National Park and we also have the, the Ngorongoro Crater. So the Ngorongoro Crater is the, they call, in Tanzania we call them a, like a garden, it's the Tanzanian's Garden of Eden. And it is the world's largest volcanic depression. There's nothing uh, large like the Ngorongoro Crater. It is the largest in the world in terms of depression. And it was formed about 2.5 million, million years ago, and it, 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 it is gone. It collapsed. So that, that's why it, it has the highest depression. So most of the volcanic er eruption, they, have, they pour the, all these materials upward, but this one, it is a depression. So it is, it is very nice. So in this Ngorongoro crater, you have a lot of other wild animals as well so it is a very very nice place to go and see animals and also see how nature how nature looks like and a lot of people come and see uh, how beautiful is this crater and we have also the Zanzibar we call it the spice island where most of the spices come from Zanzibar and this Zanzibar has been there for many years has been a very very famous place for slavery and there are a lot of good stories and bad stories as well but the good story is that Zanzibar is very famous for its uh, uh, spices and also has very beautiful beaches and most people who, who, who come to Tanzania they definitely have to go to Zanzibar to just see how beautiful is this small island is. We have unpolluted beaches and we have many different kinds of uh, uh, spices. You know the spices, right? So we have cinnamon, we have nutmeg, we have vanilla, we have cloves, all these beautiful spices. So it has the most beautiful beaches in the world. This is what they say. And I also believe, because I have been to Zanzibar just once, but it is true. They have very, very beautiful beaches, very clean beaches. 
And they have also other places that are very nice for, for visiting. They have the, what they call the, uh, they have what they call the Bruce Safari. There's a prison island. There's also a house of wonder if you, you wanna go. And there's also Josan Forest. It's a national park, it's a very beautiful. So I just want to, after talking how beautiful is Tanzania, so that is just a small section of it. We have a lot of other national park and beautiful areas just to, 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 to observe. So I have just named some of the like, biggest attractive areas in Tanzania. So let me just pass you through the climate change drivers, like what are the key issues that uh, drive climate change in Tanzania. So in Tanzania, unlike most developed countries, so most of our climate change drivers are from land use change and forestry, and prim primarily from deforestation. When I talk about forestation, I mean cutting down trees. And we cut trees mostly for fuel, like charcoal and firewood, because these are the most common sources of fuel in Tanzania, charcoal and firewood. So we, we cut them, we cut the trees just to make for firewood and we cut trees to make charcoal and then we can use this for cooking. And then the, another driver is uh, agriculture expansion because um, my, as I said, my country is the population is, uh, is now like 60 million, but we used to be like 7 million in the 1950s. So in the space of these few years, you can see how much the population has ex exploded. So what it means is that, and because of the poor agricultural technology that we have, so what most people do, they just go in the forest, they clear down trees, plant some, some, some crops, first year, two year, second year, I mean, I mean, first year, second year, third year, maybe fourth year, they find that, that that plot is not producing that much enough food, so they have to move again, find another beautiful land, cut down trees. So they, what they do. So we have been doing that, and that means we have been reducing our forest cover, and also we have been affecting the soil structure, and the, the, we have been also affecting the the soil fertility. So this is just an, the picture of what is what actually happens. As you can see, they normally just clear fair, they cut down all the trees, and then they, they, they plant what they want. But then after some few years, then they have to move again. We call it shifting agriculture. So it's, an, it's not a very good practice. And this is because they don't have kind of good agricultural like practices and also there might be some issues with agricultural mechanization like lack of equipment for agriculture and also issues like fertilizer and stuff so that's why they they don't do like an intensive agriculture like what you do here so this is what happens. So in this case, deforestation in my country, they are estimating that every year we are losing about 508,000 hectares per year. This is the size that we are losing every year. And if you compare this with one of the states here in the US, it's actually equivalent to the size of the Delaware. So every year we are cutting down trees of the size of Delaware State, which is it, is, it is very much, right? It is very significant. So what they are trying to estimate is that under this, uh, what they call uh, BAU, a business as usual scenario, if we continue doing the same stuff, so they are trying to estimate that in 82 years, so the whole of the country be a desert. So if we don't do anything to, pre to prevent this, so in 82 years, we, we will see all the country being a desert. 
And in terms of um, carbon dioxide emission from deforestation, the contribution is about 58.5 million tons per year. So this is what I was talking about. You see these two ladies, they are carrying on their heads these uh, firewoods. So this is actually what happens. They collect this fire, take them with them home for them to cook food. And on the other side, you see this beautiful lady. She's kind of trading. So this business is very lucrative and a lot of people, especially in the, in the rural communities, they're getting this, they're going, they're doing this business because it is very, very profitable. They make very good money because just one sack of, you see like that sack, it in Tanzania shillings is like t from 25,000 Tanzanian shillings to 50,000, which is equivalent to like $10 to like $20, which is a very good money. So on the other hand, it's a very good business for, for people who live in the rural community, right? But it is, not a very good business in terms of the environment. And the bad thing is that it's not, it's not that these guys in the rural community are using this charcoal. Most of this charcoal are used by people in the cities. So all the city dwellers, because they don't have, like, they don't have electricity, they don't have gas like what you have here. So most of the energy they use for cooking is charcoal. They don't use firewood. Because fire, they cause, I mean, they have all this smoke, so they don't need, they don't want the smoke. So they, they like the charcoal. So most of the charcoals, they are being uh, used by city dwellers. So, and this is what happens. You see these ladies, they're using charcoal for cooking. So if you try to estimate like how much uh, charcoal is used for the whole of Tanzania and how much firewood is used for the whole of Tanzania, the statistics shows that charcoal for the whole of the country, the rate of use is 37%, 37% charcoal for the whole country. But firewood for the whole country is 71%. So in, in, in a summary, it's like most of people in Tanzania they use firewood, right? Most of people in Tanzania, they use firewood. But if you compare the fuel consumption in cities, right? Like cities vis-a-vis -vis rural areas, you find out that charcoal use in the urban areas is very high. So in the urban areas, almost 80% of all the, the charcoal that is used, I mean, 79% of the charcoal is used in the urban areas. And in the rural areas is on less than 8%, you see? So more charcoal in the urban areas, very, very less charcoal in the rural areas. But more firewood in the rural areas and less, less charcoal in the urban area. So if we want to control or try to prevent, to reduce the rate of deforestation for, 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 for charcoal, we have to provide these city dwellers alternative to energy. So if we can do that, then we can solve a very significant, and we can, we, we can solve this problem and also we can save a significant amount of our forest. So this, is, this graph just shows our contribution, the greenhouse gas uh, emission contribution. And as you can see, most of our emissions comes from land use change in forestry, which means the deforestation, agricultural expansion. So 72% of all our emissions comes from, they come from a land use change. So agriculture is about 17.3% and energy about 7.8% and the rest. So most of our greenhouse gases are from land use change in forest, which means deforestation. So I, this is the second driver, population growth. As I said, in Tanzania, 
in 1950, we were s about 7.5 million people, but now we are about 60 or 60, almost 70 million people. So you see, in just in a space of 69 years, the population has increased almost nine times. So what they're expecting that in 69 years ahead, like in 28, 2088, the population of Tanzania is projected to reach 265 million people. So, yeah, but the problem is that you have the same size, same land, right? But the pressure is getting higher and higher. And because of unsustainable agricultural activities and all these different other activities, we will end up like losing everything. We will pollute our waterways, we, pro we will destroy our forest. And I don't know. So we have a lot of things to do in terms of population. Like we need to make sure that we try to slow down the population growth because we know this is going to affect us in the near future. So what are the climate change impacts in Tanzania? They are a lot. So these are just some of them. We have been having temperature increase and we have, ha we have been having reduced uh, precipitation, I mean drought. So the, the, the amount of rainfall has been decreasing. And also we have been having seasonal variation like this, this year, especially for my city, we normally uh, expect uh, rain from the, from the month of February, like late February all the way to April. But for this year, we have been having very, very uh, little rainfall. And m most of the rain came was very late, like uh, May or something. And people were not able to plant because that window is not enough for, for someone to, to have good harvest. So we are expecting that this year is going to be very hard for most of people in Tanzania. And we, we, are, we, are, we have also experiencing flooding. So it's kind of funny because you have drought and you also have flooding. This is one of the challenging aspects for climate change because some of the areas might have very, very strong rainfall while others might have very, very dry weather conditions. So we have some areas that constantly experience flooding and we have also an issue of pest and diseases and we have also an issue of sea level rise salt intrusion especially in the areas that are very close to the to the coast and we have been having also land use conflict people are fighting each other over pasture especially farmers and livestock keepers they are all competing so there have been clashes and sometimes people kill themselves and we have also been experiencing invasive species species from different other countries and we have also been experiencing migration of people. So you find that people from one region, they find the area is very, very inhospitable. So they have to move, to find some other areas that they'll be able to live. So we have been experiencing these people are moving from one part of Tanzania to another areas. So just in pictures, this is, Actually, what is, this is just a few pictures. The right hand pictures, it is a Maasai guy with his head of cattle. He's trying to find out where are the best pastures for his cows. So this community, they have been, they have been affected a lot because they have to move their cows very long distance to, far, to look for pastures and water as well. So because of the drought. And on the uh, right hand side, you see elephants in the drying river. So these elephants, they're, they're starving. They, 
they don't have enough water. So the, the river drying up. So we find out that most of our animals, the beautiful animals are dying because of lack of water and some of them are also dying because of lack of pastures. So with, this, with the Maasai communities, there have been a number of crashes because they don't have improved like uh, uh, infrastructures for, for cows. So it's not like here, you, just, you have everything, right? You can take your cows for, for dips, you can take your cows somewhere, they can have water, you can treat them, everything is provided. But with these communities, there is very, very few or poor infrastructures for, for cows. So that's why they need to take them a long distance to find for water. They have to take them a long distance to find for pasture. They have also to take them a long distance to, to get treated if they have diseases. So in Tanzania, what the research shows is that the annual temperature has been uh, increasing. So it has increased by 1% from 1960 to this time, the temperature, the average annual temperature has increased by one degrees of centigrade. And it is also projected to increase to 1.5 degrees of centigrade in 2030 and two degrees of centigrade uh, by 2050 and 2.7 by 2060. So we are expecting that the temperature will keep increasing. So we are expecting more drought periods in the coming few years. and. In the, in the coming, uh, maybe in a decade or something. So this is actually what is happening. And the precipitation, the amount of rainfall also has been decreasing by two millimeter, right? So they measure the, the, the amount of rain in terms of millimeter. So the, the rainfall has been decreasing by two millimeter per decade. So for every 10 years, the temp I mean the rainfall has been decreasing by two two millimeter since 1960. So we have this delayed precipitation. We have also prolonged precipitation. As I said, some of the areas, they, they receive very high amount of rainfall, while others, they receive less. So overall, livestock keepers cannot find water and pastures. And also, uh, there have been growing tensions between farmers and livestock keepers over water and pastures. And also, our wild animals are dying because of the lack of water, pasture, and habitat. Because people, they just cut down trees, so they destroy most of the habitats for these animals. And the crop, there have been research, and they are estimating that we are losing about 300 and 380,000 uh, tons of maize and legumes uh, every year. So this is the amount of uh, legumes and, and maize that we are losing, which is pretty significant, uh, which is equivalent to about 96.6 million US dollars. So that's a good money. So we are losing this because of the drought. So almost every year. So this is a scientific report. So these are some of the invasive species I was talking about. And the, on the left side is called the four armyworm, and so we call it the Wavijesh. So this is, it is native to the America. This one is actually in the, it is even in the US and in the southern part of America. So we don't know how did it come to my country but it was first reported in Africa was in 2016 in Nigeria, Sao Tome, and Togo. And in 2017, just one year, it was reported to spread to more than 30 African countries in just a span of one year. And it destroys crops. It is one of the deadly pests that is actually wreaking havoc to most of people in my country. And the other, the other uh, speech on, the, on my right, right hand side it is called Gugu Karoti. In Swahili, we call it Gugu Karoti. It's Parthenium hysterophorus in the scientific name. And it, 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 it was also 
uh, report in Tanzania in 2010 and it was around the International Airport. It was, one, it was around the Kilimanjaro International Airport. And this airport is pretty much responsible for most of the tourists. So maybe some of some tourists who came in, they came with this. So it was first reported in the uh, Kilimanjaro International Airport. And it is also native to Central America. Uh, it is toxic to animals. And when animals eat this, they die. And if you also, you, if you get into contact with that, they cause skin rashes. So it is not a good, a good, uh, a good weed. So this is also one of the pictures that shows how floods actually affects ourselves. So people have been dying and we have been losing our infrastructure. So the government has to spend lots, lots of more money to rebuild these infrastructures. Instead of spending this money for developing the economy, for develop, uh, developing people, the government is spending a lot of money to just fix all these uh, damaged infrastructures. And people have been losing lives and properties as well. I think you know when hurricanes come in, or you know well how damage they cause. So people have been dying and also have been losing uh, a number of uh, infrastructures. So this is just the prediction. This is the scientific prediction, like how much we are losing, and with with no with no adaptation, and how much cost we are going to incur if we do uh, any mitigation measures. So all these two graphs they show that. The cost is going to be higher and higher if we don't do, if we just sit, right? So the cost is going to be higher and higher. But if we do something, the cost is going to be reduced. So these two graphs that kind of trying to say, you better do something, right? Because if you don't do it, at the end of the day, you're going to spend a lot more money to just try to fix the damage. And this is, uh, I don't see, if, I don't know if you can see clearly. I said one of the uh, impacts of climate change is salt intrusion. So this is one of the studies they conducted uh, two university, the University of Aridhi, we call Aridhi University in Tanzania, and the Uni University of Dar es Salaam. So they did this study just to know how much salt is actually intruding our wells especially for those people who live very close to the, to the coast, coast areas. So what they noted that they did all the, they did all the holes, right? They tried to establish like control points. So they were measuring, checking how much salt is in there. So what, what they noted is, is that the, 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 the amount of salt has been increasing. So most of these people they are losing all these good waters for drinking. And the worst part is that because of the salt intrusion, even this, the, the, their farms, this, the, the soil fertility of their farms is also affected because you have more salts and then you won't be able to produce the amount of foods that you used to. So a lot of people have been affected and we don't know. So at the end of the day, we have to move people. We have to relocate people from those areas because they cannot survive anymore, figure out where we can take them. And it is very hard to deal with this situation because so sea level rise is, is, is not only like a local issue, it's a global issue, right? So there are a lot of stuff that needs to be sorted out. So what what is the government doing? So there are a lot of things. I just uh, decided to select this. So the government has, be, has been doing a lot of things to try to tackle the climate change impact in Tanzania. And one of it is the development of the climate change strategy. So in 2012, the government 
uh, develop its first climate change strategy. And in that strategy, they have identified a lot of other issues that they need to be addressed and the way how to address them. So we have the climate change strategy, strategy in place. And also we have the National Climate Smart Agricultural Guideline. As I said, that most of, most of our people, they just do that agriculture which is not suitable, right? It's not sustainable, slash and burn, right? They just slash and then they burn. And then they shift every year or after a few years, they have to move and find another beautiful land. So those kinds of agricultural activities, or sometimes some of these people, they just uh, do their agricultural activities on the hilly areas or on the sloping areas without taking all these uh, what we call climate smart agricultural practices. So the government decided to prepare like a package, like what are the best agricultural uh, practices that are climate smart. So we put that in place and we are trying now to educate our, our farmers how best they can uh, get good yields in a very small piece of farm using these uh, selected uh, CSA practices. So it's a very good strategy. And there are some of the areas where we have been piloting this and it's very successful. We hope if the government will push this and we get more collaboration and funding, maybe we might be able to at least help these, these farmers instead of doing the business as usual kind of agricultural practices so they can employ this beautiful, uh, we call climate smart agriculture. And also we have also what we call the agricultural climate resilience plan. It's a five years plan. And it has also several set of priority areas. I'll, I'll talk later on. And we have the red, the, what we call the reduced emission from uh, deforestation and forest degradation, land degradation, the lead plus pilot project. So this is the, it's an international effort to try to develop this kind of business incentive is a business incentive so you ask farmers to plant trees and then because we know trees have the tendency to sequester carbon from the atmosphere so as they do that they beat their biomass so if we we be able to measure like how much carbon is stored in those trees then they can estimate how much money is worth of and these people can be paid. So it's an international kind of incentive mechanism. So it was uh, piloted in Tanzania and we have nine pilot areas. It, not, it's, it is not doing that much well, but it's, it's a good, it's a good um, intervention. And we also have the climate information, what we call a, the area warming system. We have our Tanzania Meteorological Agency, which always gives information. They have 10 days information, they have 30 days information, they have three month information, and they have six month information, and they have annual. So they keep updating our community, like what is going to happen in the next few, few years or few months or few weeks. So this is our priorities. So Water use efficiency is one of, is the first priority. We need to make sure that we use our water very efficiently because we know water is a scarce resource, right? And water is almost everything. You, can, you cannot survive without water, right? So this is our national priority, water and climate smart agriculture as well as our second priority. We have land, soil and water management, climate resilience, crop varieties, disaster risk management, and the risk goes on. So these are our priority actions. So what are the challenges? Because I've been talking about the risk, the drivers, so what are the challenges that are affecting the, the efforts, I mean, the, the stuff that you want to do? What are we experiencing? What, what, what is going wrong? What's wrong? So 
there are a lot, but these are just some of them. So there's an, an economic issue that the budget allocation for combating climate change is very, very small. So the government does not put much effort in into climate change issues. So most of the funds, they are directed somewhere else. So this is one of the uh, significant challenges that we have. We have also political issue. Most politicians are after power, they are less concerned uh, with climate change. So they are only more concerned with like getting votes from people, that's their main, their main concern. So there is not that much political will. And you know, if you don't have political support, it's very, very hard to break through. And we have also institutional challenge. Most of our institutions are weak because most of them, they depend from the government. So the, their budget is from the, the, from the central government. So if the central government has no money or has decided to like, shift its priorities, then you have an institution, but it cannot buy it, right? So you, you don't have the means to reach to people, you don't have the means to do your stuff. And we have also a social issue. We have that catch of we are embracing childbearing, so we want more children. And yeah, and, and most people in Tanzania love children, so, and my president too. And he's also encouraging people to have more children because he, he wants to have many people and he's planning to have like, in a, he, he, he's planning to make Tanzania as an industrialized nation. So he wants to have more people to work in these industries. So he's encouraging more people to have more babies so we're expecting that the population is going to, to increase very, very, uh, very much in just a few years to come. And there also, there's also an education issue, like majority of people in Tanzania, they might not have the good knowledge, especially for climate change issues and some other stuff. So it becomes very hard for, for them to change their way of doing things. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that marks the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. So if you have any questions, I'm more happy to respond to them. Yeah, so the mic is there. So that was a very powerful presentation. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, I wish it were more positive. Uh, but the, the two, two general thoughts occur to me. One is that climate change is really a, a global issue. Yes. So uh, even if your country were to have significant financial resources to combat climate change, you're still going to have these issues of changing weather and things just because it's a global problem. What, what strikes me as, as a really essential local uh, issue is, is your deforestation. And you mentioned, you know, the drivers for that, the, the fuel for, for uh, cooking, and also economic driver for, for the, the uh, uh, residents to, you know, just get a, a significant income from, from harvesting. Uh, also, the agriculture contributes. It's just a, a series of issues all uh, sort of pointed in the direction of yeah. deforestation. Uh, uh, the, the one thing that uh, comes to mind, and I, I tend to think it's relatively impractical, but it, it seems perhaps a long-range direction, yeah. is, is to essentially convert your cooking strategy. Uh, in the United States now, we're, we're pushing or at least, I uh, shouldn't say the United States, I shouldn't say anything about our federal government, but um, w one of the key strategies is to, is to get away from burning fossil fuels. And th these are not fossil fuels, but burning fuels. So uh, what, what's the direction we're going is, is electrification, to even uh, cook with electricity. Uh, and then, then there's the photovoltaics, the, you know, 
collecting, uh, generating electricity from the sun. Uh, so I, I, I recognize that these are relatively expensive strategies, both generating electricity and, uh, and having the facility to cook with electricity. But it seems perhaps in a, in a longer range goal or strategy would, would be to, to change that, that cooking uh, method uh, or, or practice. Yeah, so I, I do agree with you 100%. And as I said, is Tanzania has a very good like um, natural gas resources. Yeah. And we have been having all these international organizations coming into the country doing more exploration and some companies have already started uh, digging out. And the only problem is that because of our poor uh, urban planning, especially in the big cities, cause all these houses in the urban cities are not that much well organized. So it is very difficult to have a very good uh, system for to make sure that every house has natural gas supply. And even if that could be solved, there's another challenge as well because some of these companies, they just take this natural gas and they export them. So you find out even our contracts are not that much in the benefit of Tanzanians. So you find that the majority of the natural gas does not end or being spent in Tanzania, they just export it. So that's the very bad thing. But with the electricity, the government has decided to put more hydro electrical dams. So we are building now we are almost starting to build a very huge dam. So we'll be generating about 21,000 uh, kilowatt, megawatt of electricity. So we hope that will maybe help. Like, because uh, we have, we don't have reliable electricity supply. Mm -hmm. So that makes electricity being expensive. So people cannot afford that's the problem. So in order to solve that, the government has uh, decided to embark into that very, very big project. And it's going to spend a lot of money. But it, it is going to try to help address this challenge. So we are trying to do that. I agree with you on the photovoltaic cells. It is also a good approach. But the only challenge is that most of our communities we, we had we had one project with a solar cooker international in Tanzania, mm -hmm. in, 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 in there's one city called Arusha, and they tried to have all these photovoltaic cells people to use for cooking. This project it didn't do that much as we hoped it will, and because most of the uh, one of the challenges is that it you have to spend a lot of more time using that. And most people in the rural communities, they don't want that because they have to wake up early in the morning, go into the farm, come and cook their, their lunch just within a very short period of time, like 30 minutes, the food is ready, they eat, they go back to the farm. But if you use that, you have to spend like 80 hours. So that's the problem. But it's a very good, it's a very good approach. And we have also been trying to like, uh, develop what we call improved stoves. So the kind of stoves that you use less and less charcoal and less and less firewood. So these are the kind of the mitigation measures we have been putting in place just to try to slow down the rate of deforestation. But if we can supply all the big cities with electricity if we can supply them with uh, natural gas, the problem will be solved. But then that will also affect the rural population. I mean, the, the, most of the youth in the rural communities because that is the 
that is one of the key income generating activities they have to go in the forest cut down trees make charcoal sell cut down trees firewood sell right so we need to give them alternative like income generating activities as well speak but I uh, just one one quick comment yeah the, the goal from a global perspective especially for a developing countries would be to omit the natural gas infrastructure costs and go directly from wood to electricity uh, it, you know the, the, the natural gas would be much better yeah. than, than than burning wood but it's still you're still burning fossil fuel so yeah if, if you're gonna have to spend a lot of money to put it natural gas infrastructure it, it might be, from a global perspective, it'd be, it'd be more beneficial to go directly to electricity. But I'll, I'll let other people. Yeah. There's still something I don't quite understand it, to follow with what Jim is saying. Um, you're thinking that photovoltaics means having to cook your food all day long in a little solar cooker. But photovoltaics, the panels on my house, provide, feed into an electric system. Oh, that's something different, right? See, if you, oh, could get, okay. if you could get solar farms or solar on your rooftops or you know, large oh. scale solar that's providing electricity, you would not develop this, the uh, natural gas, you would develop solar instead, but that would be easier to get into your individual homes, how they're made. I get that. And then you would have a stove that just turns on. I get that. And that could turn on and cook your I, lunch quickly. I get that. I think that is a very beautiful intervention because we have sun like 24 seven, mm -hmm. <laughs> all year round. So most of our cities, most of the areas in Tanzania, we have a lot of sun. So if we can have that project, like most of the houses, especially in the big cities, have solar panel on their house, that would be very nice. Yeah, and that cost, yeah. here at least, is coming down, down, down very quickly. And so I, I would assume that's a worldwide phenomenon, that those solar panels are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to the point where it's undercutting the cost of, it's way undercutting coal, and I think it's, undercutting um, natural, I don't know. Uh, it might be undercutting natural gas. If you had to do the whole infrastructure of natural gas, I think it might be undercutting that as well. So that just going straight to solar might be much cheaper for you than going with natural gas at all. Um, I see. See, I, yeah, I think, I think that could be helpful. Really quick comment if I could. I've heard about in India, yeah, they're making uh, they're making uh, s very small sort of individual size systems where uh, you have a solar panel collects solar energy, makes electricity. You have a very small battery, and then you have the ability to to use a very small amount of electricity. It could could be for a cell phone, could be for cooking, but but they're very individual small scale systems that you put on on each each residence. Okay. So it's I think it's India that's uh, that's l implementing that. Oh, that's nice. So I I'm not um, too familiar with the other parts of your climate. Do you have a lot of wind? Yeah, there's some of the areas like um, we have one area in Mbeya. The some of the regions in Tanzania they have they are windy. Yeah. So wind and there was, uh, just to cut you short, then there was, they did like a feasibility study to see if they can put on those areas the wind turbine. Mm -hmm. They did that feasibility as well, and it was very positive. So I think the problem was how to find the, the funding for that. But we do have pretty many areas that they have wind. You had the questions, right? Um, yes, I was just going to ask you, um, in this 10 months that you've been here yeah. at UC Davis, um, have you um, seen anything, especially 
in terms of um, forage, uh, forest management and uh, sustainable agriculture? Have you learned anything or, or heard anything that you um, feel that you're going to take back with you? Yeah, the, the, the many areas that I've visited. Mm -hmm. So you see there's this difference in my country in the U.S. So in the U.S., the land ownership is different from Tanzania. So here, you find one person may own very big, right, chunk of land, right? And he might be able to protect it, conserve it, right? But in Tanzania, it's different. So you find like a household has maybe 0 0.5 acre or one acre, two acre, three acre, four acre, like maximum, right? So just very small, small pieces of farms. And the other, the other part, most of the other part is, is what we call, uh, it's like public, it's mm -hmm. public land. And what, what happens is that most of the illegal activities, they, t they, they take, they happen on those areas. So there's some of the protected areas, some of the protected where all the human activities are prevented from happening. But because of the poor management, people just get in mm -hmm. and they cut down trees, they do whatever they want. So what I have noted here is that it is very easy here to manage a very big area, but in Tanzania it's very difficult. It is very, very difficult. But I, I had one very good example. We went down to, I can't remember the name, well, in the Bay Area, there is this uh, organization, they are trying to ask farmers, right? not to sell their land, not to sell their properties to investors. Mm -hmm. yes. And what they're doing, they're actually compensating them. They want to make that land forever. Yeah, for conservation. So that's a very good approach. You have your land, you can make use of that land, but you cannot sell it to other developers, come in and put in like infrastructure and whatever. So you dedicate that piece of land for, for conservation. So it's a very good approach. So that I think if we can also do that, that will help. Yeah, we need to grow. I know that we need to grow. We, uh, we want to grow, right? We want to be like, um, like the US maybe in 100 years or something, right? So we will still need to use some of our resources but we don't need to go through uh, the ways that the US and the UK and the other developed countries, they went through damaging the environment. We need to balance all this, but we need to develop. So we will have to pollute in certain ways, but we have to be careful. Yeah, that is, and also have been working with many U.S. organizations have been working with the UC Davis Aquatic Toxicology Lab. I've been doing what we call water sampling, uh, chemical analysis, I mean water analysis, and also been doing toxicity testing, so which is very important because when I go back home because of this industrialization that is happening now, Chinese are coming in the country, putting up industries. We know that in few years, I mean, most of our cities, most of our waterways will be polluted. So we have to have to we have to get prepared to know how to do the measurement, how to know like which kinds of pollutants are in our waterways. So this is what I have been doing at UC Davis, collecting water samples, doing the analysis, and when I go back home, it will be very useful. And. I have also been learning other stuff like project management mm -hmm. and climate smart agriculture as well. I have, I have worked with the 
USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. We were trying to develop like a training curricula for Tanzania for climate smart agriculture. And I was involved in that, uh, in that process. We actually went back to Tanzania for two weeks to pilot that project. So, yeah, I have learned a lot of stuff. And I'm hoping, and I also, I, I don't have to forget, I'm also developing an app. So in Tanzania, what we don't have, we don't have a very good system for reporting environmental misconducts. So if someone pollutes the environment, information flow is not that much organized. So I came up with this idea and then the UC Davis Design Lab, they say it's a very good thing. So we are developing an app. So if someone sees someone polluting the environment or cutting down trees, polluting the environment or whatever, he sends the information to us. So we share all this information amongst ourselves and then we can respond to that incident uh, faster than we used to do. So I'm working on that uh, app and it's almost ready. So when I go back home, I take that with me and I hope it will uh, improve our conservation I mean, initiative or something. And I think it might also take me to another level. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to share with you that. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, you're in a drought right now. Yeah. And how is it going with um, growing food crops? Are our crops failing for lack of water? And then therefore are people hungry or and animals? Or I mean, is in the, in the, Parks, is there food for the animals? Or is there water <laughs> for the animals? Uh, the impacts on both the people and the animals. Yeah, so the impact is very, very, uh, it's very big. And as I said, most of the areas in Tanzania, they didn't receive rainfall at the time that they should receive it, right? So they prepared their farms, but there was no rain. Some of them even planted, expecting that maybe they, there'd be rain, right? But then there was no rain. And most of the rain, they went to Mozambique, causing floods in Mozambique. Oh, yes, yes. So we didn't have floods, uh, we didn't have rain because our rain went to Mozambique. <laughs> so there'd be a problem. And in, in May, that's, that's when it started raining. But by then, you cannot plant because it's a very short period of time. And for maize, for example, you need like three month period for you to harvest. But May and June, June is summer. Summer time starts in June. So you have just one month rain is not sufficient unless you have like maybe irrigation agriculture or something. So majority of people in Tanzania won't have uh, sufficient food this year. And, and our animal too. Yeah. So animals will be suffering and people will also be suffering. So we maybe, we don't know. Some of the areas like in the northern, I mean the southern highlands of Tanzania, they might have sufficient food. But there is this problem for distribution because of the infrastructure and stuff. You might have more food in one area, but how to get those foods from that area to other different parties is also a challenge. So many people in Tanzania this year, they will be suffering. They will be suffering for sure. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for this. Huh? So we hope you come back. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. And I also welcome you to Tanzania. It's a very beautiful country. Very nice country. Please come. I have my landlady. She's coming to visit my country this coming June. So 
I'm asking you to come as well. <laughs> My neighbor is going. Oh, your neighbor? My neighbor is going. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So you're welcome. Tanzania is one of the peaceful countries in Africa. Very, very strong and stable. <laughs> that nice. So Tanzania is very beautiful, very beautiful place. I, yeah, I think you, if you find some time, please visit. And I, I am always there. I'll be always there to welcome you guys. And I'll take you whatever you want. <laughs> yeah.